Thanks for your prayers and, and uh, thinking about what we're going to do tonight at our Sunday evening service. I'm excited about it. And, and if you can't come and be a part of it, pray for it. I mean, we've just been praying for a long time how God might give us more inroads to touch a greater segment of our community here in Santa Barbara. And I think just by simply translating the 530 service into Spanish, it, 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 God may have his hand on that. So let's find out. So please pray for that. The other thing I want to say is thank you for your prayers for Ingalil and the team that she's a part of doing ministry in Nepal. Uh, she's been going there, and her aspect of the team, the team is doing a few different things, but her aspect of the team is to do a dental missionary. I, I don't know if you know, my wife is kind of like a third world dentist. She goes out to places in the developing world, and she cleans teeth, she pulls teeth, she fills teeth. She does it all. And, and this last week, uh, you know, I think they did three different clinics. On two of the days, they, she, she said she saw... She treated more than 120 patients over two days. She said she pulled, she pulled more teeth than she could count. Does that sound gnarly? So anyway, uh, she sent me a text just, just a little while ago, and she said, uh, praying for a great Sunday service, tell people to pray for the three upcoming clinics. We want to help as many people as possible. Kiss, hug, kiss, hug. All right. That last part was for me, but... Uh, Really, uh, just keep in mind, thank you for your prayers last week, and uh, just remember to keep praying for her. Um, our text this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 3. We're going to begin in the middle of the chapter, verse 22. So please open up your Bibles there, John, chapter 3, verse 22. Um, Father in heaven, we pray for a blessing upon your word. And we pray now that you would give us wisdom and grace by the presence and the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, of course, I pray that you'd bless Ingalil and the Dabneys and others who are on that team in Nepal and Thailand. Uh, give them a special blessing for this coming week. But Lord, we believe that you are a great God who loves all the earth and that you can pour out blessing upon us right here in Santa Barbara as well. So do it, Lord, for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, as we come to... Uh, John chapter 3, verse 22. We're dealing with a passage having to do with John the Baptist. Now, we've already seen the work of John the Baptist in the Gospel of John chapter 1, but now John, the Gospel writer, comes back to John the Baptist as we see it here in verse 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Stop right there at verse 22. I don't know if you've ever realized this before, I have to say, this is one of the things that I kind of had forgotten about until I studied it afresh this week in this week's text. And it just sort of, you know, struck me as, wow, I had forgotten all about that. Jesus himself did a work of baptizing people. That's what it says in verse 22. Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea. He remained with them and baptized. Jesus, together with his disciples, did a work of baptizing, apparently quite similar to the work of John the Baptist. Now, this doesn't surprise us because we know from the New Testament, especially from the Gospel of Matthew, that when Jesus began his preaching work, his message was just the same message as John the Baptist. John the Baptist's message was, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And when Jesus began to preach in all the cities around Jerusalem, um, uh, Galilee and then into Judea as well, his message was, repent for the kingdom of God is here. And as an expression of that repentance, it makes sense that he would lead people into baptism. So the bottom line is this. John the Baptist continued in his work of baptizing people as an expression of their repentance, an expression of them wanting to be cleansed and prepared for the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus did the same thing at the beginning of his own ministry. It was Jesus' way of putting his stamp of approval upon John's work, but saying, yes, it's a good thing for people to prepare. It's a good thing for people to repent. Now, again, John didn't stop his baptizing work. Look at verse 23. Now, John also was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there and they came and were baptized for John had not yet been thrown into prison. So John continued his baptizing work. He did it at a particular place in the Jordan River at a place called Anon, which, by the way, there's a little bit of controversy as to where that particular place was. There's a place when you take an Israel tour, they almost always visit. In just a couple weeks, our church is going to have an Israel tour, and we're going to be there, and we're going to go to a place called Bet Shan. 
which is one of the most spectacular sites in all of Israel. What it is, it's an ancient Roman city that was destroyed by an earthquake and through the miracle of archaeology, you, they, they've reconstructed a lot of it and you get a sense of what it was like to be in an ancient city at that time. It's, it's mind-blowing. You walk the streets, you see the pillars, you see the stadium, you see all these different things there at Bet Shan. Well, this particular place seems to be about six or seven miles south of Bet Shan, right by the Jordan River. That's where John was doing his work of baptizing, continuing on. Okay, that sort of sets the stage. Now take a look at verse 25. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified. Behold, he is baptizing and we are all, and, excuse me, and all are coming to him. So apparently some of John the Baptist's disciples got into some kind of dispute, a debate with some of the Jewish leaders. Now, we don't know what the details of the dispute or the debate were. But in the midst of that dispute and the debate, it had something to do with purification. In the midst of that dispute and debate, they came back and told John the Baptist, John, did you know that Jesus is also baptizing? And everybody's going to him. Do you see that line in verse 25? Verse 26, I mean. He is baptizing and all are coming to him. Now, again, we don't know exactly how the dispute worked out. Maybe it was something like this. The, the, the Jewish religious leaders are talking to disciples of John the Baptist. Hey, so you guys think you got a work of purification going on in your baptizing work? Yeah, we're leading people into repentance and cleansing. Well, then what about Jesus' baptizing work that he's doing over there? And they go, what? Jesus is baptizing people too? I thought that our, you know, rabbi, John the Baptist, I thought he was the only one doing a baptizing work. And these Jewish leaders go, oh, no, no, no. Jesus is doing a big baptizing work. And you know what? He's drawing more people than your master, John the Baptist, is. It, it probably went something like that. So the disciples of John the Baptist go, what? Jesus is doing a baptizing work? Well, nobody told us he was going to do that. And they go back to their master, John the Baptist, and they are upset. They cry out to John the Baptist, John, did you know that Jesus is baptizing? And worst of all, he's drawing a bigger crowd than we are. All are coming to him. They were alarmed. Now, how's John the Baptist going to take this? Is John the Baptist going to say, oh man, if Jesus is doing that, then we got to step up our work of baptizing even greater. We got to get in a better band to do a better work for the pre baptism work. You know, man, we got to get the light show and the fog machine going at our baptism work. Because, you know, there's too many people going over to Jesus' work of baptism. What are we going to do to draw our share of the crowd? Is that going to be John's response? All right, now the following verses, verses 27 through 30, are really the core of what we're talking about this morning. John is going to explain to his disciples, and he's going to give them four reasons why it doesn't bother him one bit what's going on. Okay, because that, that's the bottom line. It didn't bother John at all. His disciples were all upset. Oh, there's, there's more people going over there. Jesus is baptizing. What's going on? Didn't bother John the Baptist one bit, and he's going to give them four reasons why. So let me read those verses to you, and then we're going to take it apart piece by piece. Ready for this? Verse 27. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but... I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Now, if this answer didn't seem crystal clear to you from the mouth of John the Baptist, it's because he's speaking in very Hebraic forms and figures of speech but it's no problem if we walk through it piece by piece I think you'll understand exactly what John the Baptist was trying to communicate back to his worried disciples the first thing he says is in verse 27 notice this he says a man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven the first response of John the Baptist is, is hey disciples don't worry Everything I have in my ministry is a gift from God above. It's all God's gift. And 
If Jesus of Nazareth is drawing large crowds in his baptism, then that's God's gift unto him. Chill out. God is in control of all of this. And friends, isn't that a great reminder for John the Baptist and his disciples? Everything is a God gift from God in what we get to do for him. Therefore, therefore, we should receive whatever God gives us to do gratefully. You know, I, I started teaching the Bible when I was a very young man. Quite out of the blue. It's not like I had any experience or any pedigree or any, you know, declared desire to be a teacher of the Bible. But quite out of the blue, when I lived in Ventura, I was 16 years old, and the pastor of a small Calvary chapel there said, hey, do you want to go teach a bi home Bible study that I've been doing in Ojai? Quite out of the blue. He just, can you want to do it? Okay, great, I'll do it. And it's not like he saw anything great spiritual or profound or destiny or anything in me at all. He just knew I was a 16-year-old kid who loved the Lord and had a car and was willing to drive out to Ojai. <laughs> and you know what? Um, it, it was really an amazing work of God that happened there in that home Bible study. When I started, there were six or seven people doing that. And I taught that home Bible study from the time I was a junior, sometime in the middle of my junior year at high school, to the time I graduated. So for about a year, year and a half, I taught that home Bible study. When I started, it was six or seven people. And when I ended, it was seven or eight people coming to that home Bible study. <laughs> but you know what? What I had there was the gift of God. It was the gift of God. Listen, sometimes preachers like me or leaders in the Christian world, we need to ratchet back our expectations and we should be grateful that anybody wants to hear us. Really. I mean, listen, whatever God gives us is the gift of God. And we've got to readjust that kind of thinking that we're owed some kind of response, that we're owed some size of particular. Are you kidding me? Whatever you have is the gift of God why don't you be grateful if there's three people who want to hear you talk about Jesus? If that's the gift of God unto you, then that's the gift of God. You know what? Maybe God knows in his wisdom that that's all you can handle. So why don't you just chill out about what you think God owes you in a particular thing and just say, Lord, whatever you've given me is the gift of God. That was John the Baptist's first response. Now his second response, look at verse 28. He said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. John also reminded his disciples that he knew who he was and who he wasn't. He goes, uh, disciples of mine, may I remind you, I'm not the Messiah. I'm not the Christ. That's not my job description. Now, it doesn't mean that I'm nothing. I have my place in God's plan. I have my place in God's kingdom. Look at what he's given me to be. Verse 28, he says, I have been sent before him. I have the glorious privilege of being his herald, his messenger. I have a place in God's kingdom. I know what I am and I know what I'm not. And that's a very important thing for anybody who's going to serve the Lord. You know, some of the most helpful things that come to us when we have a desire to serve God is to find out what we're not called to. There's this weird thing in the Christian world. And I don't know how we break it. I mean, I try to speak against it when I can. I don't know how we break it. But there's this weird thing in the Christian world that kind of comes up and says this. If you really want to serve and please God, you should be a pastor. If you really want to serve and please God, you should be the guy on the platform speaking to people. And, and, and that is like the summit of, you know, of, of how God uses it. No way. Are you kidding me? Listen, if you really want to serve and please God, find out what he's called you to, find out what he hasn't called you to, and just get in the sweet spot of what God wants you to do. Maybe God wants you to be someone who works hard, loves his family, supports his church, prays for the community, and is used of God in whatever way he calls you to do in the church and the community. Then you have totally fulfilled God's call in your life, and you will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And you know what? You're probably going to hear it way ahead of a bunch of pastors who were called to do their thing, but were lazy in what God gave them to do. We got to get out of our mind that, 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 you know, if you really want to please or serve God, you need to be this or you need to be that. You know what? You need to be what God has called you to be. That's what it is. And John had this grace to know. I know what I'm called to be. I know what I'm not called to be. For if God is using Jesus of Nazareth in a different way, it doesn't bother me at all. 
I know that I'm fulfilling what God has called me to be. That was the second answer. Now let's look at his third answer in verse 29. He calls himself the friend of the bridegroom. John explained to his followers that he was like the best man at the wedding. He isn't the bridegroom. In other words, I'm not supposed to be the focus of attention. The best man isn't to be the focus of attention at the wedding. You know, and if he is, there's something wrong. All the focus should be given to, well, let's face it, first the bride. But then the bridegroom. It's the wedding couple that should get the attention. And John says, don't you understand that it's appropriate? My particular slot, my particular job is to be the best man at the wedding. Now, I want you to understand this. When he does this, he calls Jesus figuratively the groom. And you know what? There is a whole subtext that I'm just going to mention. I can't even get into this on a side point. But this is a way of calling Jesus God. Why? Because all throughout the Old Testament, the figure is represented again and again that God, Yahweh, the Lord God of Israel, he is the husband of Israel. Therefore, when John the Baptist deliberately represents Jesus as the bridegroom, he's saying he's God. And this is something that comes back again and again. I have to say, on this new time that I'm going through the Gospel of John, I am blown away that even more than ever than I thought, it's pointing out to the fact, Jesus is God, Jesus is God, Jesus is God. And this is a subtle but clear way that John the Baptist was indicating that. But do you see why he's okay of that? Matter of fact, he goes on and he says in verse 29, therefore this joy of mine is fulfilled. I'm so happy that Jesus is getting more attention than me. This is how it should be. One might say that John the Baptist lost his congregation to Jesus and he was happy about it because he realized this is my role, this is my place. I'm not the bridegroom, I'm like the best man. Now, the final thing that he does, this is number four, look at verse 30. He must increase, but I must decrease. John says this is how it needs to be in life. See that man over there, Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah? He has to get bigger and bigger. He has to get more attention, more focus, more acclaim. That's right, it's appropriate. He must increase and correspondingly, I must decrease. I want it to be more of Jesus and less of me. And isn't that a beautiful and a powerful statement? Matter of fact, isn't this a great motto? over every ministry, over every Christian life, over every servant of God. He must increase, but I must decrease. You know, I think that this parable, or this, this statement, I should say, applies clearly in at least three ways. And let me point out how this applies. Number one, clearly, this is the kind of attitude that a Christian leader should have towards Jesus. There is a tendency for anybody who stands on a platform. Whether it's me as a preacher, whether it's the worship leaders, whether it be anybody else, anybody who stands on a platform in front of other people, there's always this subtle thing of saying, well, maybe I should draw more attention to myself and not so much attention to Jesus. No. John the Baptist's statement, his very eloquent line, it's so easily said that we can all remember it. He must increase, but I must decrease. We can remember that. We can grab a hold of it. And everybody who does any kind of public ministry should remember that. You know what? Jesus needs to be exalted. His name needs to be sent forth. If you leave here remembering me but forgetting Jesus, it's a failure. But if you leave here thinking about Jesus and forgetting me, that's a huge win. That needs to be the attitude in every servant of the Lord towards Jesus. But it also needs to be the attitude that every Christian leader or every pastor, or I should say every congregation, needs to have towards other churches, towards other congregations in the community. In other words, this attitude of John the Baptist preserves us from one of the worst things in modern American Christianity, and that's a spirit of competition among churches. Friends, you know, it isn't easy. It wasn't easy for John the Baptist 
to see his ministry shrink and another's grow. But he had to say, no, everything is given from God above. I've got to accept it. And I'm just going to serve the Lord continually in what I do. I want that to mark my thing. Lord, you must increase and I must decrease. You know, in the 30 plus years that I've been in pastoral ministry, 30 plus years at four different ministries. You know, when I think about it, those terms, I think, why can't I hold down a job anywhere for any appreciable <laughs> period of time? 30 plus years in four, and now this is my fourth different ministry. I think about it, and what I've seen is I've seen that it's just very important for pastors to understand that a congregation doesn't belong to them in a possessive sense. They're there to serve the Lord, to serve the people, to serve the community, and to not see themselves in competition with other churches or pastors or congregations. Not at all. Matter of fact, they have the need to realize this, is that we are essentially on the same team. And another person is leading people to Jesus and preaching God's word and making disciples for the glory of Jesus Christ, then I'm happy for their work. And I hope, I hope they would be happy for ours because we realize, to coin a phrase, we're putting up points on the same scoreboard. That should be our attitude. That should be our heart. But friends, not only is this relevant for the attitude of the individual Christian servant, for a congregation as a whole, not only towards Jesus, but towards other congregations. But isn't this just a tremendous motto for each individual Christian life? Every person in this room can say truthfully, he must increase, but I must decrease. Now, I know that's troublesome to some people. They, they kind of say, wait a minute, man. I don't want to disappear. Why, why would I want it to be all Jesus and zero me? Doesn't God have a, a love and a significance and a place for me? Why does it have to be Jesus, 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 and I'm a great big zero? Now, let me tell you this. It's that when you have the mindset that you really want to exalt Jesus, when you have the mindset that John the Baptist had that said he must increase and I must decrease, you actually become more of yourself in God's plan and God's role than ever, ever before. You know, one of the glorious things about John the Baptist, number one is he didn't shut down his work. He didn't get all pouty and say, well, if Jesus draw more people than me, then what's the point? He kept his work going. He said, listen, if Jesus draw more crowds, wonderful, God bless him. I'm going to continue my work the best way I can. And he continued it. And it was successful. It was blessed. It wasn't as blessed as Jesus is. But if John the Baptist had this great competitive mindset that all that mattered to him was having a bigger congregation, so to speak, than Jesus, he would have been in a lot of trouble. It didn't bother him. He must increase, I must decrease. That's the one thing. But the second thing is this. Do you realize that as John the Baptist utterly committed his future, his fame, his reputation to Jesus, that Jesus took care of all that? John the Baptist was incredibly influential and famous. So much so that more than 20 years after this time, in a city more than 1,100 miles away, there were disciples of John the Baptist. How does that happen? Because God said this to John the Baptist, John, if you'll put your focus on me, I will take care of your life. I will take care of your legacy. I will take care of your reputation. You see, and that's how it should be for any of us. Jesus, I'm going to put my focus on you. I'm going to have the attitude, you must increase, I must decrease. And then I just leave it all in your hands. If I'm to have a name, if I'm to have some acclaim, if I'm to have some influence, then it comes from you. I'll know it isn't the product of my own ambition. I'll know it isn't the product of my own grasping. I'll know it is truly from you and I'll be satisfied with it. But Lord, I don't want one atom of fame. I don't want one molecule of influence if it's not from you. And I'll just receive whatever you have for me. That works so beautifully, so powerfully in the life of John the Baptist. Now we come to verse 31. Verse 31, commentators are kind of split. Some people think that this is continuing the words of John the Baptist. Personally, I think that way, but I can't be certain. Other people think that at verse uh, 31 here, 
John the evangelist begins to comment kind of and take up the narrative from John the Baptist. So we're not entirely sure if these are the words of John the evangelist or John the Baptist. I kind of lean towards making it the words of John the Baptist, but it really doesn't matter either way. So let's take a look at the starting at verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. It's almost as if, in my mind, John the Baptist is saying this, and he's beginning to wax a little bit eloquent here. He must increase and I must decrease. And you know what? You want to know what I think of Jesus? Let me tell you what I think of Jesus. I think, verse 31, that he is he who comes from above. Let me tell you, everybody, where Jesus came from. Jesus came from heaven. I came from the earth. John the Baptist would say, I know God has used me. I know I have a called place in his plan. I know I have a particular role, and I'm happy about that. But make no mistake about it. I'm not on the same level of Jesus. He came from heaven. And that's why he says in verse 31, he who comes from heaven is above all. Therefore, we should listen to him, and it's just fine with me if he increases and I decrease. Even though the tragic thing is, is look at what he says in verse 32. No one receives his testimony. It's as if John the Baptist prophetically anticipated the rejection that Jesus was going to endure in his ministry. And he's using a little literary hyperbole here. No one receives his testimony. Of course, some people did, but in relation to the whole... I mean, listen, when Jesus left this earth, he had 120 disciples. But how many thousands heard him preach? How many thousands heard him do his, or saw him do his miracles? I mean, in relation to the thousands upon thousands that he touched, you could say, well, almost nobody went after him. Almost nobody believed him. Even though, notice this, he was certified as the truth of God. Look at it there in verse 33. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. That's what John the Baptist says. He says, I certify that this is true. I'm not making this up. This is the word of God. He came from heaven. And then he continues on, verse 34. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. For God does not give the spirit by measure. The father loves the son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. But he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Friends, these three verses, 34, 35, 36, they start uh, start out in such a beautiful, soaring, sweet way. I mean, look at this, verse 34. He whom God has sent speaks the words of God. Jesus is a uniquely visible and reliable revelation. He has the Holy Spirit without measure. You know, the previous prophets that ministered, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all the rest of them in the Old Testament, even John the Baptist himself, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, but not without measure like the Son of God himself. No, no, no. The God doesn't give the Holy Spirit by measure to the Son of God. And might you say prophetically the same way is true for those who are in the Son of God by the new covenant? We have the promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as well. But that's not really what John has in mind here. He has in mind the outpouring of the Spirit upon Jesus of Nazareth himself. No, he he comes from above. He speaks the words of God. He has the Spirit without measure. Do you see what the whole point of it is? Put the focus on Jesus. Take it away from me. I can't emphasize this enough. Look, I, I hope to live a Christian life that honors God. I hope to live a Christian life where people can say, hey, you know what? This trusting in Jesus thing works. Look at the life of David Guzik and you can see that that trusting in Jesus works and I can learn something about how to follow God and hopefully you'll learn something about confessing and repenting from your sin as well by looking at me. You're not gonna get an example of perfection from me, but hopefully you get an example of trusting in God. But at the end of it all, if you put your trust in me or any other human being, you're going to be disappointed. Jesus is above all. 
Jesus is the one upon whom we focus. Jesus is the one who is uniquely sent from heaven. He uniquely had the words of God. He lived the word of God in a unique way. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit without measure. Therefore, look at what he says here. He says, he who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Again, I'm absolutely impressed at how different this is from anybody else in the Bible. Could you ever imagine Moses saying that he who believes in Moses has everlasting life? He believes in Ezekiel has everlasting life. Could you imagine Paul the Apostle saying that? He who believes in Paul the Apostle has everlasting life. He'd be laughed off the stage. But Jesus is different. Jesus. And I think of how crazy this would sound to somebody who's a complete stranger to the things of Christianity. Jesus is God and man. He's different. Therefore, to put your trust in, to hope in him, to rely on him, is to have everlasting life. But we can't deny it as well. Look at verse 36. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. Is there something in you that said, John the Baptist, why'd you have to add that last sentence? What a downer. You were doing so great when you were exalting Jesus. You were doing doing so great when you told us how you believe on him and there's life in the sun. We get that, John, wonderful. Why'd you have to throw that last bet in? And I think John the Baptist would say to us, because Jesus is the man sent from heaven, There's a heavy price for rejecting him. If you reject the son, you receive the wrath. A lot of people think that refusing to believe in Jesus Christ and rejecting him. I don't mean to sound crude. I'm going to say something that's a little bit crude here. But I'm just trying to bring the force from that figuratively giving Jesus the finger is a small thing. But it's not a small thing. Because he is the man sent from heaven. Give me the finger, who cares? You give Jesus the finger, he's different. He's the man sent from heaven. And what we're talking about here is the wrath of God. I like what a commentator named Merrill Tenney said about this quote. He said, the word does not mean a sudden gust of passion or a burst of temper. Rather, it is the settled displeasure of God against sin. It is the divine allergy to moral evil, the reaction of righteousness to unrighteousness. It works like this, friends. To reject the son is to reject his gift, eternal life. You can't tell Jesus, I want the eternal life, but I reject you. Jesus said, it's all tied up together. You reject me, you reject the eternal life that I came to bring. Let me conclude it with this. I'll go back and refer a little bit to last week's message as well in the first part of John chapter three. John chapter three has four interesting and I think engaging musts that we should pay attention to. You could say this, John chapter three is a must read chapter of scripture. Why? Look at the different musts of John chapter three. First of all, there's the sinner's must. Verse seven says, you must be born again. That's the sinner's must. Then you have the savior's must. So must the son of man be lifted up. The sinner's must is that I gotta be born again. Jesus's must is that he had to be put on the cross. And then there comes the sovereign's must. That's in verse 30. He must increase. And then after that comes the servant's must. I must decrease. You know what? This all makes sense if Jesus is who the Bible says he is. If he's the man from heaven. That's what comes back to you and I. If he really is God the son, then it makes sense. If he isn't, then this is really just a weird story. But I believe, I hope you do too. If Jesus is who the Bible says he is, doesn't it make sense for you to make the motto for your life this week? He must increase, but I must decrease. Father in heaven, that's what I pray. 
I pray that you would write that. I pray that you'd write that principle into our hearts as a congregation and as a church leadership, Lord, that we'd really have it in our hearts. You must increase, but we must decrease. But Lord, I pray too that you would make it written into each individual Christian life, starting with me, that Jesus would be more and more exalted and we would be more and more surrendered. And Lord, we do not want one bit more of attention or influence or wealth or fame or anything else. We do not one, want one bit more of that than what you have appointed to us in your great plan. Help us to live in the sphere in which you've all called us. We thank you for it all, Lord. We just say humbly, you must increase, but we must decrease. We pray it, Lord, together in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship him together. <laughs>